greetings. Vice Chancellor and um, valued guests, I would like to extend a very sincere gratitude to you and the whole of this university community for inviting me to share my thoughts and experience about this rather difficult subject matter. I mean, I looked around and I sensed your institution is probably one of the first institutions in the country that, or at least I know of, that has opened a platform and supplied voice for this rather uh, bedeviling and bewildering phenomena. So I want to thank you for that. And I want to say it is not surprising to me that you were able to attract two of the people that I admire the most. I mean, Advocate Tuli Matonsela, we go from way back, as you'd said. And I admire you for being able to take decisions, whether they are popular or not. And you served our country well. You were a good steward, and, and thank you. And then Professor Kobo de Matibizel Pumla. You hold a special, special place in my heart. And you're not only a big sister to me, you're a confidant and a role model to many. I mean, you're extraordinary and so amazing. You've been with me at most defining moments of my life where I could have fallen, but I stand on your shoulders. I think for this country, I mean, your special blend of rather delicate sensitivity to all components of the human being and the courage that you've shown through your work to teach us about forgiveness and our generosity of our humanness is, is amazing to me, even if at times we're not ready to hear and digest that. So I'd also like to extend a special voice of thanks to the unit that you chair for hosting and making my stay here so, so beautiful and so amazing. So some may ask, why would a judge of a high court make it a business to tackle such a morbid and difficult subject matter? I mean, the image of my son hanging by his neck from his own belt on the still of the curtain rail, facing the blood moon and the horizon the night before, in what to me seemed like a symbolic surrender and a giving up of his life. Early hours of the 28th of July, 2018, will live with me till the end of the days of my life. So in some way that excuses me from finding wit and intelligence and humor about this subject. Yivali's death reverberated across the globe and at his funeral at Hilton College I sensed that there was something more to this death of despair. I mean, how can someone so um, erudite and um, sociable, so handsome, and outwardly had everything going for him, just end it so abruptly? 
I sensed that there was a message in this and I had promised to distill my understanding of this message and share it. We are socialized to fear death and a death by suicide is a complex matter. In its wake, it leaves a lot of confusion and a lot of pain and there's a lot of blame and there's a lot of shame and the answers are not always clear. Sometimes it's the parents whom we think are to blame and sometimes it's the deceased who we think we are to blame. They were weak, there was fault somewhere somehow. I think the lack of a rational explanation complicates the grief. In my investigations, I found a conspiracy of silence around, around this issue. I found that families would live with a sense of shame in the wake of this tragedy and suffer in silence and in isolation. I want to thank all of my friends for the love that they've given me during this time and my family, my son Asante. I stand each day and put one foot in front of the other on the wings of prayers of so many people, known and unknown. And most particularly, I feel so grateful to be part of a cohort of colleagues and judges who've given me so much support. And I want to single out particularly um, my three bosses, Judge um, Mlambo, who's the judge president of our division, his two deputies, Judge Mejabelo and Judge Letwaba, and particularly my colleagues in the Gauteng Local Division. I also want to single out uh, Judge Mandisa Maya, who is now the president of the Supreme Court of Appeal, and some of her colleagues who put this incredible ring of support around us. And there is encouragement to have suicide, mental health, and mental well-being reflected as a deep social concern. And I want to assure you that I stand here with the comfort and knowledge that in various institutions, we are starting to look up and sit up and try to shed some light to this. And thank you for being part of that. Having said all of that, the reflections I'm about to share with you, they are mine, and they are mine alone, as a mother and as a citizen. They are not based on any academic research, but are grounded on the truth of my experience and my observations in the life of my family. And because of the fortune I received in the past months, these reflections are also an offering to all mothers, single parents, families struggling with mental health and mental well-being. I want to pay tribute through this. It's an offering to pay tribute, especially to the young people who saw nothing on their vision boards and that the only choice that they could make is to die. There is no name for this loss and this de death. So I pay tribute to all families who have gone through the loss over the generations. My paper has a lot of statistics and data, and I'm not going to bore you to go through that, but just to share it with you the highlights. <coughs> In our work, we consulted with the SA Anxiety Depression Group, and part of the highlights are that the incident of 
suicide is on the rise, and in South Africa, it affects a lot of young people. And the statistics they have do not include incidences of suicide and deation. Of that, one in four teens have experienced a sadness and a sense of hope and hopelessness. And of that data, the number of people who are not at work because of a depression or some other related issue is also on the rise. But what was most intriguing for me was that this data shows that when it comes to suicide, whilst it affects younger males, at least in South Africa, it knows no race, it knows no class. And I flag that as most intriguing because of the continuum of despair on the one hand and privilege on the other, nothing seems to insulate any one of our families from this phenomenon. I have considered that this is a country risk and if we don't roll up our sleeves and resolve it, it's going to cost us immensely from a demography point of view because if some of us outlive our children, the investment we've had in their legacy and in the legacy of the country is equally com compromised. I'm also mindful that the data also shows that this is a global phenomenon. But what I've seen is that in most, in some of the developed countries, whilst young people express um, a need for assistance around mental health, data shows that the middle-aged men in America and elsewhere are the ones deeply affected by suicide. And it's also shown that insurance companies are repudiating claims and in some instances limiting the ability to seek assistance. So what is going on? What is this phenomena? What is this brewing storm that has come to eat us? In my case, my son, uh, took the trouble to write and to explain himself in the best way that words can. And in one of his letters, he says, it would be inconsiderate to say I am lonely, but I have been lonely as long as I can remember. I hope you, reading this letter, will never experience the loneliness I have felt. Thank you for trying. I no longer wish to. In the work that we have been trying to do, we have heard that others express the sense of wanting to go home. I have asked, like many, who are these children that we have birthed who are these children who are so super sensitive? They are shooting stars that shine too intensely and only to explode just as swiftly. I have also asked, who are we in relation to our children? Are there struggles and are there death, a symbolic rejection of who we are and what we have become? and what we stand for. I spent hours and hours with Ivani's therapist, Rebecca Simpson, to try and understand how it is that somebody would be surrounded by so many people who adored him, and someone with his incredible achievements could experience such deep loneliness. She said to me, Tina, I spent years and years with Yvonne. 
the loss of his father at the age of five and his super intelligence. He was almost autistic. We're at the root of what clearly became a personal fragmentation, a personality fragmentation. Ivani was savant. We didn't know this. We didn't know of the savant syndrome. When uh, Rebecca last saw Ivani, it was in 2017, July, he had chosen to do a master's in economics and finance at the University of Edinburgh, Scotland. At the time, his decision seemed right and insightful because the year he registered in Edinburgh, uh, your own universities and institutions were in flame. During the summer holidays, he came home and he complained about an anxiety which we had tried to treat. That summer we learned he failed economics and he had returned to Edinburgh to rewrite his supplementary exam. By this time, I had lost every penny I had worked for the past 21 years to what I regard as corporate bullying. I had no finances to resource the fight. So the deal between him and I was that if he failed economics, he should come home and we could reconfigure the next steps. I think as single moms, we all know it's not an overcompensation and you will see why. We turn our pockets upside down for our children. Nothing, nothing will stand before what we need and what we need to do for our children. So I turned up my pockets upside down for his education because for me, education was the gateway or at least when I grew up, education was the only gateway between poverty and servitude. When it transpired that he didn't pass economics again, he finally refused to come home. And I resorted to stalking him on Facebook and his brother would laugh. And I then had a sense that because of who he was, I, I must leave him. I spoke to friends. It was the most painful time of my life, feeling that I've lost contact with my child. And I subsequently learned he persuaded his faculty to register him but he couldn't progress to the second year. And in December 2017, he phoned home after a long time and he cried and said, Mom, I'm so sorry. I feel like I've disappointed you. There were no words I could say to comfort him and to tell him that I sense that you wanted to try this on your own and I am so proud of you and I respect that. And he cried about the loss of connection and we thought we could make amends for him to maintain that connection. But be that as it may, Ivani's anxiety descended into a depression and at the time that he got home in June, 2018, it seemed he understood he's not going back to Edinburgh because I was clear that I needed to have him home to try and reconfigure and sort this out. So my understanding of depression from him was that whilst there is a medical definition to this, 
there's a deep lowering of the spirit, a hollowing out to a point that one feels pressed underground. We danced around our kitchen counter with me trying to get him back to therapy again. And he couldn't. So Rebecca reasoned that, or rather, Rebecca and I reasoned that the fragmentation of his personality was starting to show as time progressed. And treatment required that he must break down to deal with the underlying grief and a new identity if he was going to make a breakthrough. To me, Ivani's death echoes a large gap between how he saw himself, how he wanted to be in the world, and how this was not showing up at his vision board or in his vision board at that time. I emphasize at that time because for young people, there is a sense of agency, the currency, and the now. And there isn't a deep understanding that honestly, sometimes things do shift with time. I can sense, can any one of us relate to this experience of living in a space where you see nothing on your vision board? I mean, there was a very clear sense of failure to meet his purpose. And one of my deepest hurts as a mother is my inability to support him and help him readjust in his dreams. So we established the Vanimbali Foundation to dig deep into the issues and to look at intervention programs. This has led us to very meaningful conversations with parents, with young people, with various groups on this phenomena, and in particular, in this case, anxiety and depression. In a very inadvertent way, it led me to look, as Tuli you say, at my own mental well-being. It was in retrospect during this time that I realized that I had lived with this deep sense of anxiety, which was excavating due to social circumstances and childhood trauma until recently. I learned that anxiety, in fact, is a deep evolutionary pro protective instinct. It is to keep us safe. But however, when the brain takes seizures of this, there are no words. You cannot say, don't worry, it's OK. It lurches into the fear of our minds and can be uncontrollable. I remember a time of trying to negotiate a, a work, work life, job, motherhood, widowhood, widowhood, and all. And even before I put my foot on the ground, the grip would cease. So, why then are we seeing this rising trend? I sense we are on the edge of evolution as humanity, we're sitting on a ticking time bomb. Everyone can attest to the fast pace of change. I mean, globally, we have seen the rise of this information age with transparency, something we value on the one side, and yet a lack of trust, manipulation of information, and fake news. Our sense of wealth is now easily determined by the number of like clicks we get on Facebook. The ties that we have formed are false and are not real. We see an instantaneous rise of underage millionaires. We've seen the collapse of borders and unprecedented migration of people Places which we idealized as places of progress are suddenly not safe. We've seen innocent people being mowed down 
in London, France, Munich, for one cause or another. We have felt directly how decisions made in boardrooms in London, in New York, have a direct impact on us. Decisions made by people we don't know and people we've never seen. All of a sudden impact on whether we've got money for transport or we can put food on the table. We see that our ideas about gender identity are up for scrutiny. Closer to home, we talk endlessly about unacceptable levels of inequalities. We've seen our family units and community structures in ways that we've never imagined before. We've got child-headed households which are on the rise. Very recently, 31% of graduates are unemployed. The recent election result shows us this disaffected youth. So this phenomena has no race and has no class. I'm going to share some of the work that we have done later on with my son Asante together with very valuable friends, Jackie Opperman, Megan Debier, Michelle Odan, and Andiswa Doni. And thanks to these wonderful friends, especially Megan, who introduced us to Martin Kulungubanda of the Presencing Institute, and his wife, Egi, daughter Bobo and Neo. This work has shown us that we are living in the midst of at least three known divides the ecological divide, the social structural divide, and the spiritual divide. The question though, however, for me remains, so in our context, what is this loneliness about? What is behind this void? Where and what is home? Can we find home other than in death? How should we understand this sense of non-belonging? Is there, is a space of belonging possible? What does that look like? Is it geographical? Is it based on some nationalism or nationalistic agenda? I can only dissect through a socio-political and psychosocial lens because they mirror to us the likelihood of our institutional response to this. And you don't need to agree with this lens. I've put a red underlining to our post-colonial and apartheid history. I'm also aware that when one frames something in this manner. There's a knee-jerk reaction and response to discount or even reject the lenses because there's an inherent discomfort both sides and we seek to distance. And the quick response would be, but Tina, this is a global issue and a global concern. My reflections nevertheless are that these two systems resulted in structural dehumanization first seen in the Industrial Revolution. I raise both because we tend to deal with them from a distance rather than as systems that we have created and as systems that have shaped us in very innocuous ways even though we reject them. Both systems relied on a social construct and a false identity devoid of the deeper truth of who we are as humans. Both systems entrenched the human being as an instrument for production or some other. And that separation between family and work entrenched the mask that we carry about and that system demands that I behave differently 
from who I am at home as a wife and a mother and who I am at work. School even relies on this separation between who our children are at home and who they are at home. As said, I trace the development of the mask and the persona to these systems. This mask can put food on my table. This mask can see my rise in recognition and status and the like. This mask determines my value. Secondly, I highlight this to disconstruct the value systems that we've innocuously inherited. And I view this along indigenous aspects of way of life. And please do not misquote what I'm trying to show because it is not an idealization of indigenous life or that we should return to skins, but merely to show the different nuance in the value system. For me, the one represents a rigidity and a frozen internal life as opposed to feeling and expression. The other represents these values of dominance, win or lose, rather than harmony. The separation and differentiation rather than the value of inclusiveness. Displacement from the earth rather than a sense of rootedness. Extraction to take rather than to give. Maximization of production as opposed to taking carefully what is required at that time and no more. Supply and demand, which gets us into a trance about the finite nature of resources rather than the infinite nature of supply and generative nature of who we are. So our world is organized around these deep insecurities. And all this is in the guise of efficiency, but efficiency for just the few. Now, with that history of aggression, dominance, conquering, we keep repeating this in our institutions. We keep reenacting that regardless of who fall on the historical divide. We've inadvertently embodied these principles as our way of life. I believe these have a negative effect on the human psyche. They perpetuate this sense of non-belonging, even as we try to integrate new identities. We dismiss the very evolving nature of who we are. There's no recognition or empathy for the painful isolation of those people who do not fall in any of these polarities of historic definition, let alone our inability to see the other. And curiously both isolate and misuse shame for self-punishment and self-hate. Given this then, who are our children? I mean, most of us, as said, come from this generation where we revered education as a means to get out of um, poverty. My own children were shocked to learn very recently that to get that education, I worked in some hotel in Seapoint as a chambermaid, and that we walked from Guguletu to Mowbray in order to be on campus. I had a job as a cashier at the first pick and pay that opened in Claremont. There was nobody to back me up. I had to back up my dreams. I mean, my children's father, who graduated as a chemical engineer amongst the first black chemical engineers at UCT in 87, tells a story of how, through metric, they never had a laboratory and he would teach everyone from a textbook. And he only saw a laboratory at university, but still managed an applied mathematics distinction and a chemical engineering some years later. So 
The reason why I point this is not to evoke guilt, but just to show that we have become a generation that is so adept to hardship. We have been so adept to even cruelty. And we've become so highly functional. I want to shorten this and say, with all of that, we have created the image that our success is effortless, which is a lie. We've created the image that our success comes at no price, which is a lie. A dad's dialogue and dinner we held recently, dads spoke of this sense of a rupture of their relationship with their children. There is a disjuncture between the external achievements of the parents and where the children stand. Truly, there can only be so many firsts in a democracy like ours. So our children can never really truly match our own achievements. Be that as it may, how has it played out in their lives? I'm convinced that inside these deaths of despair is a transgenerational human trauma and suffering. In all aspects of the divide, I mean, we've defined our children in inanimate terms. Lost generation, generation X, this, that, black diamonds. I wonder about this. I mean, talking to young people the last few months, they say, well, we want to be happy. And I say, happy? What do you mean, happy? What we fail to understand, I mean, we trivialize their language. What we fail to understand is that for them, happiness is wholesomeness. It's not a posture that we have come from. We've come from service and duty and survival. I believe that their struggles actually are struggles to awaken us to our deepest humanity into our innocence. I am very critical, having been there myself, of this model where we are curating these super, super kids. Some from well-off families who are suddenly going to change the world and change the things that we have created. We are putting on them intergenerational pressure they haven't created. And I doubt that our education system is responsive to this either, because really, we are supposed to educate for that soul and what that soul's purpose is and what that soul's needs are. Be that as it may, here we are turning them into pretzels. So what is my call this evening? I'm calling for a review. I'm calling for a review of this model of functionality. It is false. It is not based on the true deep human needs. We link people to opportunity with no resources or tools for internal repair. I'm calling for a review of the systems and structures and conditions for existence that we have created, as well as the beliefs that we hold, that hold this suffering in place. I'm calling for the close scrutiny of our model and ideas about resilience. It is shocking to me that when someone has survived the Holocaust, the genocide, the apartheid system, all of which have been called inhumane, unnatural, and a crime against humanity. Yet we use these models as a measure of resilience. There's something bizarre to me about it. Because all of these 
atrocities against human beings have left dents and footprints of dents on the human soul, generation after generation. They are a weight, a psychic weight on future generations. So I'm calling for a scrutiny of our inhumane organizing principles. They are last century, they are not fit for purpose. So what will make this place home? What will make this place and this sense of non-belonging? What are we deeply yearning for? I think the need to be valued, to be seen, to, be belong, to belong, to meet our purpose is an inherent, sacred human need. My first building block is the Rainbow Nation. South Africa, as far as I know, is the only country that is reconstituted on an inclusive principle. It belongs to all who live in it. I know we had to leapfrog a number of stages of institutional development and punch way above our weight. For the last decade, we have immersed ourselves in building these new institutions. We spent time conceptualizing concepts like equality, liberty, community, efficiency. And my second point, my second building block is the Mandela legacy and the South African strength to wake up the human in us. I know that Mandela's legacy is highly contested, at least in some ways politically. My sense is by seeking forgiveness and reconciliation when the underlying healing was not ready, stretched our capabilities as a young nation beyond what we could do. It doesn't render the principles invalid. I'm very partial to Mandela. I mean, I am a direct beneficiary of his, I am a direct beneficiary of his appealing to this deeper humanity in us and the in unimaginable in us. At a certain time, I was stranded with no money to complete my law degree. And this stranger behind Victor Fecht's prison, true a friend of mine who was a granddaughter, wrote to me so beautifully and said, Namla, I love you like my own child and I'm proud of you. I tell you, he's the only man who's ever said that without giving me a sense that I have to give something in return. Why is it that we do not take time to focus on the underlying message in him that sought to wake us up? I think that he reminds us that in the construct of the South African identity, there is something that is good in us. There is something that the world can learn from us. Like family, we rally together at the worst of times. I have experienced this in the wake of my loss. We still put one foot in front of another to strive for our children on our communities despite disagreements. We are known the world over for our warmth and our generosity. We stand up together when called to action. We can be proud of this. It is features in us we have not nurtured. So how is it that we can make the rainbow nation shine bright enough? How can we make the changes we need to make deep enough? 
Vice Chancellor, I had an opportunity to look at your restitution statement. It is warming, and thank you for setting the intention. I believe that we stand as a global prototype of how to heal. We bridged and showed the world how to negotiate. We can still show the world how to bridge the various divides. Yimbani Valley Foundation looks to intervene at least in two of these, the social divide and the spiritual divide. So we need to drop the stigma. There is a need to repair the ties that have weakened. And there's no Google download for this. We have to do the work. And whilst there's a place for individual healing and agency, individual medication alone is not going to help us. So through this presencing model that I spoke about, we setting up these dialogues for healing through the Dad's Dialogue, the Mom's Cafe, and the Youth Dialogue that we want. We want to drop our voices of cynicism, drop our voices of judgment, drop our voices of fear, listen with an open mind, an open heart, an open ear. We want to experience directly acts of love and kindness which lie in us. When we change, I assure you, our systems will change, our politics will change. We found that as part of this, our existence has been disturbed somewhat and we need to deliberately create zones of peace like we designate smoking areas these would be spaces of non-judgment where we can sit and look with one another and hold one another without judgment and see the pain. I know that due to the complex etiology of mental health, there is again the place for the individual. But what I have found is that not only are these services sometimes inaccessible, but they isolate the person, it is their problem, yet we are all affected too. So we need to build these future tribes. The last aspect that was curious for me is how, how do we build the spiritual divide? How do we bridge that? I have found through my work that people in America and elsewhere are coming to plow our indigenous systems of knowledge and ancient wisdoms and they package them for global markets and yet these are things that are generic in us and who we are. I stand, as I said, on the wings of prayers of many others and I know that in a secular state the idea of prayer is contested and everyone looks at prayer as edifying or indoctrinating one religion of, or another. I think that for me, if prayer means sending out love, sending out well wishes to us and to everyone, we should all do it. We should all do it. I mean, my son, even though not blameless in his personality, loved all people. I saw this with my eyes. He connected with all young and old. And I'm here to affirm and confirm the love and goodness in him. It is the goodness of who we are. And on my deathbed, of all my lineage, I want my son to be amongst those who welcome me. I want him, I want to be able to say to him, Yivani, Sivile, listen, we've heard you. Thank you. <laughs>